This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. When you ask that question, you know, I remember Cousin Tomato when I was with him up in Gatsky for all those years, and he used to say to me, Teddy, you, you learn through osmosis. I, I believe there's truth to that, if I know what osmosis is. <laughs> and and I, but it sounds good. Yeah, yeah. But I learned through osmosis with my father. He he wasn't a big talker. He was, you know, he was a doer. And I, when you're around someone who lives a certain kind of life and does certain things, uh, it penetrates. He was a doctor. He was. I, I'm going to sound like an idiot right now <laughs> because I'm being a son. Uh, but he was the greatest diagnostic. Doctor, yeah. I mean, if I say I ever knew, what's that mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Are you a doctor? You know, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, what does that mean? But other people have told me this. Yeah. Like, just legendary stories. He would do house calls and he'd help people. And like you said, a lot of people have spoken about the impact he's had on their life. He built two hospitals. Yeah. And he, he built a hospital before the Verrazano Bridge in New York, uh, connecting Brooklyn to Staten Island. And he, he built it. So people could get proper hospital care that couldn't afford it, period. And um, everybody looked at him as uh, eccentric. Yeah, nice. B- b- yeah, because, because, because he he would literally sneak patients, not sneak them in, he was Dr. Atlas. He could do what he wanted to a certain extent, but he would bring patients in without ad- administering, uh, putting through administration, yeah. so there was no charge because you know they, they didn't have anything. They were street people. Yeah. They were, I, I remember being, my only way to be with my father was to go on house calls yeah. or to go to the office. There's no, you know, and so I went on house calls with him. And he did house calls, by the way, till he was 80 mm-hmm. and three dollars. I mean, it was better than like McDonald's. You know what I mean? I, I mean, the deal. Three uh, dollars and you got medicine, you got everything. And, but he used to right around the holidays there was just certain things that i didn't understand but i understood later where we would just drive certain areas and he just all of a sudden opened his door and he would pick up these home and you know i'm Help him. i'm 10 years old yeah you know move over and move over you know mm-hmm. and it's just you him and a homeless guy a couple yeah a couple <laughs> yeah whatever he could fit in three four yeah. you know whatever it was that's a big heart and then he took him to the hospital, dropped him off. So, mm-hmm. you know, I would ask questions after it was all over with. I'd say, Dad, they're, they're sick. He goes, well, not not in a way. Well, you put him in the hospital. Mm-hmm. So he said, yeah, and he tried to explain things to me. You know, he would try. He didn't talk much unless you asked him something. Yeah. And that kind of works. And, you know, don't talk unless someone asks you something. Yeah. And he, he, he explained to me that he said, um, I said, well, why are you putting them in the hospital? Then, uh, you know, and of course the sickness was the alcoholics. But um, why, why are you put them? He's and it wasn't an alcohol rehab, you know. So why are you put them? And it wasn't for the purpose to dry out. Mm-hmm. He wasn't trying to cure them. Yeah, let's put that for before we uh, yeah. we anoint him for sainthood. Yeah. You know, like uh, <laughs> by Teddy Atlas. So I, I was like, we we finally get to the point. Why are you put them in there? Yeah. Well, because it's the holidays. All right. Why you put them in there? Well, the holidays, you know, are good for certain people and, and bad for others. Mm. And um, and it was always before the holidays. It was before Christmas, before whatever, yeah. and and um, New Year's, whatever. And so I said, why? <laughs> and he said, because they remind people, certain people, of what they don't have. Yeah. That you, you, other people are. Enjoy the holidays because of what they have. Family, you know, whatever. And it reminds them their mind is that. That's pretty profound. Yeah. And and then, I don't know remember because he didn't use the word suicide, but I I got it. Like he, he mm-hmm. basically, I forget how he said it, but like I just got it. I don't know how I got it. I don't know. Yeah. But I just got it like, so they don't hurt themselves. Yeah. That That's what came across. In every way. I don't think he ever articulated that, ever verbalized that, but yeah. They don't hurt themselves. So, and well, how how does that work? Well, it just basically, they're going to be around people 
They're not going to be alone. They're going to be around people. They're going to get fed. They're going to be warm, mm -hmm. right? And it's going to be for three days, two, three days, whatever. And it's, uh, basically, it's it's a bridge. So and the the funny thing is, a 10-year-old, I, I wanted to... I, I want to be connected to him. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I've enlisted myself in a job. Mm -hmm. When when the, when <laughs> he used to drop them off, he, he would take them, get them in, right? Mm -hmm. And um. And then the thing that I know, again, he didn't say nothing, but I, you notice things. Mm -hmm. And if you care enough, you don't, you don't notice nothing if you don't care. But if you care, if it's important, you notice. And this guy was important to me. I just was, I didn't know what a hero was. No yeah. clue. I loved Mickey Mantle. I loved Willie Mays. I loved, uh, I, I loved Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I, I, I never, ever connected in my mind as heroes. Never. My father, I I didn't connect it that way, but he... he looking back now... Looking back, he was, he was my first connection to a hero. The two of you ever talk about how much you love each other? The, the word one love? Thing, one thing that was uh, not allowed. The, the greatest memory I have my father showing me love yeah. was we were down in Florida at an airport, and, and um, we were... I was born in Miami. Don't ask where I was passing through. And uh, the rest of my family is born in New York, Staten Island. Yeah. And so I was supposed to go back with him, right? And I wanted to stay with my mother for whatever reason. And so he, you know, he, of course, conceded to it. And he's, he's okay, you know, whatever. And very quiet, very... And this is a man who never showed emotion to anyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the most, you know, really. Yeah. All of a sudden, he just turned, kissed me on the forehead, and left. And I was, I was like, "That's different." Yeah. It made me realize that some of the deals I used to make for God um, weren't realistic. When I was a kid, I used to make deals with God. Let me die before my father. And then, you know, you get older, and you have kids, you're blessed. Why did you make that deal? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for not taking me up yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. You miss them? I miss them in moments when I I'd like to know what to do. And, um, you know, I, I remember... When I would drive with him on the house calls, he didn't listen to music. <laughs> he was a guy, he read books to his, when he got older, he yeah. read books till uh, blood vessels broke in his eyes. He only read nonfiction books, science, he loved science, um, wars, mm -hmm. um, generals. I mean, I cheated on a couple of, uh, book reports because of him, because I didn't do the reading of the book the night before. I had a freaking uh, a book report to put in yeah. that. I got a book report to do on uh, Stal the War of Stalingrad. Yeah. Really? The War of Stalingrad. Yeah. And who the freak <laughs> could tell you where you yeah. get an A? I got yeah. an A. Yeah. He, I just wrote what he told me. He told me generals. He told me times. He told me strategy. He told me about the winter that came and destroyed the Germans. Yeah, and and uh, and the Soviets were tougher. You than, got an A. And the Soviets the, were tougher than the Germans. And you know the, the Germans picked on the wrong opponent. Yeah, I was already in the boxing business. Yeah, I didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know it. Yeah, matchmaking very important. Yeah, they yeah. they they mismatched. They did. They made a mistake with the picking the opponent. And so when we would be driving in the car. My father would be in a trance. And dad, he wasn't ignoring me mm -hmm. at all. He was just with his thoughts. Mm -hmm. He was he was wherever. He wasn't even hearing the radio no more. Mm -hmm. I always wonder where he was. I did. So I asked him one day. Yeah. And just so we're driving, I said, I want to know. So I said, Dad, what do you think when you're basically in this place? That I know you're somewhere. Yeah. What what do you what do you where are you? What are you seeing? I actually said, What do you see? And he said to me, I see what could be. 
I see what yeah, could yeah. be. And I'm like, oh. All right. When it saved me. How did it save you? I I was I was a stupid violent kid that was angry, not exactly know why I was angry. Uh I'd fit in real good in today's society because there's a lot of angry kids out there that I don't think they know why they're angry. I was I was just out there getting in fights and um I got this stupid thing from that. Can you tell the story of how you got that? I was just running around doing stupid things, bad things. I hurt people, some people physically, but I hurt I hurt my 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 family. You know, that's BS. Uh, you only hurt yourself. You know, that that's a good way of, you know, alibying it. Um, you know, to, but it, if at some point the truth usually finds its way. I'd like it to look like I was just hurt myself, but it wasn't, obviously. So uh, I was just out on the streets with kids that didn't grow up in the neighborhood I grew up. I grew up in a neighborhood where my father was a doctor. And... um. I walked down the street. The funny thing was down down the hill was a very tough neighborhood called Stapleton. And most of the people down there on the corners wished they could get up the hill. And I, I wished I could get down the hill. So I went down the hill. And I hung out with all these friends that became lifelong friends. And uh, I, um, I gravitated to that because I... I figured out later a little bit, but, you know, I wanted family. Hmm. We were disjointed family. We were, you know, my father was a doctor. He didn't have time for nothing but being a doctor. You know, uh, I think when you graded something, you sacrifice something too. You know, when you really graded something. Mm -hmm. So great that maybe God made you great and and you're too great for your own good. And, and I don't know, it took me to these stupid, dangerous places. Yeah. Dangerous for me, but dangerous for other people too. Because I got to the point where I was doing robberies on the street. I was, I was fighting everybody. And and you know what the most dangerous part about it was? And I came to this realization on my own, all by myself. I, I figured out. Um, I was really as dangerous. You know, these kids from the project. Some of them they got nothing. Mm -hmm. You first of all, I learned you don't have to be poor to be poor. You don't have to be deprived of certain things to be deprived and or because you at least to think you're deprived and i was poor in a way that i didn't have the only thing i wanted to have him yeah. so here i here i am where i'm out there doing these things and what made me more i was more dangerous than some of these psychopaths well, I was a psychopath too, I guess, the way I was behaving. But some of these psychopaths that really had nothing, mm -hmm. um, you know, really would, you know, they obviously would kill you. I I was da dangerous in the, almost in the same way, but for a different reason. Mm -hmm. I know it's ridiculous what I'm about to tell you, but I figured it out because uh, I felt it. I thought I was on a righteous path. I thought I had a right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it was going to get me my father back. Why? Why? I mean, you, you know, you're a scientist. You couldn't figure this one out mm -hmm. because all the people that had him were injured people, fractured people, mm -hmm. screwed up people in some ways, yeah. but but hurt, damaged people. So if I get damaged, I get him. So I was on a crusade really a righteous crusade where I thought it was okay. I had permission. I had permission to do these terrible things, quite frankly, and to fight everyone and do I I, I did. and then it it came almost to a crash of doing all that, you know, winding up in Rikers Island like an idiot. Not understanding the damage I did to this poor man that you know, he um he was a great doctor, and, and he's got to see his son and uh, hear about, you know what I mean? Like, God, I, I was out on that day, you know, with, with the guys that I grew up with now, you know, the guys from the projects, from the, as I described, and I was with one of them who, he, he's dead now. So 
I was I was with him, and we were we we were in a neighborhood, the neighborhood we grew up uh, that that I hung out in, and and, they, and he grew up in Billy. He came from the from the project, and we got into a thing where we cut somebody cut us off. We cut them off, you know, jumped out to fight, and um, you know, it turned out there's like five or six of them and two of us, and um, you know, we fought. You know, right on the side, right there. Only about a block from where I used to hang out. And um, maybe a block and a half. And right in front of like a Spanish bodega. And uh, it really does happen in slow motion. I actually saw the guy. I was fighting the guys that, that I had to fight. And then all of a sudden, I was able to get one guy out of the way a little bit. And um, I really, I noticed the guy go into his pocket. Yeah. And... um. I knew why he was going in his pocket, you know? And when he came out of his pocket, I knew what it was right away. It was weird because in, in the neighborhood, guys used to hang out. They were they were into this, you know, they get into fads, like, right on the streets. And they were into, at that time, they went to this cheap knife, but it was, they thought it was, well, we thought it was cool. Uh, it was a 007. And, and, um, and the cool thing, whatever, uh, was that, you could flick it. <laughs> you yeah. can learn. And I learned how to flick, you know, but I never carried a knife. But but when my friends would have it, I would just, you learn how to, you could flick it open. Not a switchblade, but to flick it with your wrist. And I was like, here I am in the middle of this freaking fight. And all of a sudden, oh, it's a 007, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and and so I'm like, I you got to make a decision, you know? And I got to split, I can either... Not do nothing, which wasn't didn't seem like a great, you know, uh, a great option. Um, <laughs> I couldn't run away. Why not? Because you gotta live with yourself afterwards, and yeah. and and that's more difficult to live with than whatever it is at that second, because that yeah. don't go away. You couldn't live with it yourself just, running it, away. It just don't go away. Yeah. That thing, and not nothing to do with being brave. Yeah, it's nothing to do with being brave. It, really, it, it's got to do with just common sense in life. That uh, for for me, it, it, whatever you're dealing with, it's over. It's done. Like like okay, deal with it. Go to bed. Whatever. But you you do that. You know that other thing. You you yeah. you're gone. Um. You you that never that never ends. This thing ends. The memory of you being, uh, yeah. let's say, a coward in that moment, that never ends. The only thing I had at that point in my life, yeah. in my stupid mind, was a reputation yeah. that I would do stand up to certain things. That that was like, and that for me was was worth something, whatever, because I didn't feel any worth to anything else. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing I felt a connection of worth to. So. So stood your ground. And so you I, I say, no, I made a decision. Yes. I stood my ground, but I I actually, things do slow down. They do. Mm -hmm. And I actually said, it's a 007. He's got to flick it. You know, I didn't say, oh. but he's got to flick it. I got a split second. Either, like I said, either I do nothing, whatever, yeah. or I get to him before he gets it flicked. Yeah. I went to get to it before he got flicked. And and I, and I just as I got close to him. I, I did him a favor. I, I, I walked right into a counter punch <laughs> because I, I, I cooperated with him. I went right to him. And, and just as I, he, 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 he practiced more than I did yeah. with the double seven, yes. apparently, because he was like, boom, 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 boom. And, and anyway, <laughs> Yeah, well, not immediately. <laughs> Took me a minute. I'm a slow learner. I put my hand up, right? Wouldn't you? I guess yeah. so. Mm -hmm. And it went into my face. Yeah. And that was it. It was gooey. Yeah. It was warm okay. and gooey. And I was like, I don't know. I I don't know what this means, but I don't want to know. But I think I know. And 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 um. Did you think about your dad in that moment? No, you know what I thought about him was um you don't know who anyone is until they're tested. And um I learned that.
Cus used to tell me, but I learned it. Uh, he used to say, you, I remember one time Cus, I was a 17, 18 year old kid up there and you know, thought I was whatever I thought I was. And he said, you got a lot of friends? And um, I said, yeah. Because, you know, I was on the street hanging out with a hundred kids at night sometimes on the street corner. So I was like, I don't know too many people that hung out with a hundred kids on the street, on the corner, on a Friday, Saturday night. And um, I was like, yeah, I got a lot of friends. He goes, really? Said, yeah, really? He said, um, how about if I told you you might not have any? Most likely you don't have any. And he goes, and then he just started this thing. He said, everyone's going to be tested. You, me, everyone. He goes, you don't know about nobody until they're tested. He goes, you know nothing. He goes, you know nothing until you know, until something happens to test if they were really a friend. And then he told me this story about a guy. A guy came to him, and he was upset. He goes, what are you upset about? He goes, I'm upset because I, 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 I just... Uh, I just lost a friend, uh, uh, you know, uh, after 20 years of friendship, we're not friends no more. So Cus looks at him and he goes, let me ask you a question. What, what made you think you were ever friends with him? Mm -hmm. Now the guy gets insulted. He goes, did you hear me? He goes, I, I just told you, 20 years I've been friends with this guy. Why would you say that to me? Mm -hmm. He said, well, uh, I'll say it again. What makes you think he was your friend? Mm -hmm. He goes, Whatever happened in the 20 years other than chasing girls, because I figured that one out fast, chasing girls and drinking together um, and whatever else you're doing out on the street, whatever gave you the inclination that he was a friend? Yeah. He goes, whatever, when did he risk himself to be your friend? Yeah. When was it dangerous to be your friend? When was the when, friendship when, tested? When was it uncomfortable to be your friend? Yeah. And you know what the guy said? You can figure it out. You're a scientist. He said, <laughs> he said, today. Yeah. And, and, and today came for me. And today, 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 today kept coming for me. Today. Yeah. And, and that day, my friend, Billy, it turned out, while well, I was fighting these, whatever, five, six guys, and where was Billy? He was on the roof. He was on the roof. He was on the roof. He was my best friend. And um, so anyway, they take me to the hospital. And here's the thing with my father. But one thing Billy did do for me when he got off the roof, <laughs> thank God, he did. He, he dragged me, dragged me into this bodega laid me on the floor, and started putting towels, right? And the towels, I vaguely remember this, they filled up with blood. Yeah. I mean, completely, like, drenched, like like you put them under a shower. And and um, I heard the bodega owner screaming, screaming, you know, like, Wah! you know, whatever. And everyone's screaming, and there's chaos. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm, I'm calm weird i'm like real calm and um i'm just in this place things calm <laughs> and all of a sudden i hear billy he's screaming call the car uh, call the ambulance call the ambulance you know and nobody's doing none everyone's frozen mm -hmm. i'm starting to understand already people get frozen in situations people the fear Fear, 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 fear. It just paralyzes people. And um and I was going into a fear business. I was learning. I was learning. I was getting a, a learning early PhD. And <laughs> and he in fear. Yeah. And yeah. all of a sudden, genius. Billy, genius, really. Street kid. Yeah. He jumps up on a freaking counter, jumps over the counter. Grabs the phone, calls nine one one, says a cop's been shot, yeah. and forget about it. Yeah, it was crazy. All I remember after that, I, I tell you the couple things I remember: lights being put onto a stretcher, bounced around, you know, rushed. I felt everyone's anxiety, except mine. I had none. 
but I felt everyone's anxiety, everyone's fear. Like it was all around me. It was like, wow, this is interesting. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> I know that's stupid, but like, well, this is interesting. Wow, you really have an eye for fear. That's fascinating. You're then really they, studying it. Well, they I had no choice. I I got introduced in a crash course. And they they put me in the ambulance. And this is what I remember to your point. I'm sorry I took so long to get to it. I am. Although I'll probably do it again before this conversation's over. But it's all about I, the journey. Yeah. I we'll get there. We'll get there, Pops. Um so I I hear the cops say we I we might lose them. And I'm like laughing to myself. I'm not laughing because I'm not again, I'm not John Wayne. John Wayne would have laughed. But I'm like, hey, lose. <laughs> you guys are stupid. You know, I didn't say that. But I'm like, lose me. I, my father's the greatest doctor in the freaking world. Yeah. There's nothing to worry about. You people <laughs> all you people are all uptight and whacked out here with with fear. <laughs> Uh, and and there's nothing to worry about. Doctor Atlas is my father. So anyway, so they they they're taking me to the and they said we don't have time. I hear a couple of things. I remember don't have time. Take them to and they take me to U.S. Public Health Hospital, Marine Hospital was called at the time, but U.S. Public Health, and it's in Stapleton, so it's close. Thank God. So they're taking me, and I hear them on the radio. You know, we're, we're saying this stuff about we gotta, we gotta move, we gotta move, and um, I start talking, and they're telling me don't talk, <laughs> but I like to talk a lot, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm so I'm, again, fear. There's no fear when the fear's been removed. It's the only time you're really free in life. And I know that sounds absurd, but really, it is. It's the only time you're really free in life. Yeah. I was when you close to death. When you're devoid of 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 things that that normally hold you back, that normally influence you in ways that that you know that are, are not of the influence that are always positive influence. Where you're where you're in a pure place. Where mm-hmm. you're you're in a purely free place. From all inhibitions, from fear, from anxiety, from from joy, <laughs> joy can screw you up, and, and you're free from all these things. And I'm in this place, just in the back of an ambulance. You're free. I'm, yeah, I'm. I'm like <laughs> I said, just get me Doctor Atlas, and they say we don't have time. No, 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 no. You don't. <laughs> you have to get Doctor Atlas. You have to get him. This was the. Damn it! This was the. You know what I mean? I finally freaking hit the number, and I'm not getting paid. And then all of a sudden, I'm out. How many stitches? They, well, I think it was 400, 200 inside, 200 outside, or whatever it was. That's a lot. Hey, look, after 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 50, it, uh, the number doesn't matter no more, right? Or whatever, 60, 70, 80, 90, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was fortunate. I was fortunate. And, of course, they. I was fortunate they told me afterwards it missed my juggler literally by, like, mm-hmm. Like a centimeter, I mean, whatever, and um, so then um, then we wouldn't be having this conversation, obviously. Well, I'm glad you made it. Uh, yeah, I, that's another. I'm kind of glad too, and and it just missed my eye, which thank God. It's bad enough I have a scar match me with a patch. I mean, I mean, it's enough that I got this freaking thing. And um, and look, it goes all the way. You know, I mean, it's mm-hmm. you know, it's it's pretty long, and um. I don't know. I was out, and then somehow, I sensed like they had the curtain closed, you know. And th- it's amazing how vivid this is. And the curtains closed, and I see a shadow. I I felt a presence. <laughs> I did, and I felt him. He's a oh, he's a powerful guy, and I felt him, and I just see like a shadow, you know. And all of a sudden, uh, the the curtain gets pushed back. And I can't really see. It's dark and I'm, you know, out of it. But not completely out of it. And um, pushes the curtain back, comes in, and his hand, even though it's all bandaged, you know, whatever, but his hand surveys. It felt safe. And um, it it felt warm and safe. 
I was happy. Mm-hmm. And um, he got there, you know? Did he say something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember, I gave you a little bit of introduction to my father, right? You yeah. know him now a little yeah. bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> what did he say about the he job? Said, he just said, this is what he said. I remember to this day what he said. Yeah. That that I do remember. I don't know if it was six or five people, but this I do remember. Yeah. He said, they did a good job. You're going to have a scar the rest of your life. And he left. <laughs> <laughs> He gave me a quote, and he drilled it into my head. I became his guy, you know. He loved me. I loved him. He he said to me, Teddy, no matter what a man says, <laughs> it's what he does in the end that he intended to do all along. That's what I learned from Cuz. The rest of it is BS. And, um... A lot of people um, say things. You just have to give them a minute to f- let them show you eventually what they really meant by it. I also learned from him that uh, everyone's afraid. Because this way of saying it, another great saying, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, anyone who's in a situation where fear should be prevalent, where fear is actually necessary to survive the situation, anyone who says that they're not afraid, they're one of two things. They're either a liar or they should go to a doctor, find out what the freak's wrong with them. He was right about that. You know, we live in a, a taboo society where that word, to a certain extent, is taboo because it invokes weakness. You know, we we are, we are just layers of what we saw and learned since we were kids. We all are. We're products of those layers. I learned that on my own well, through some help. At the end of the day, um, you know, fear... People will find their way of avoiding that term. So they use the word anxiety. They use the word, you know, butterflies. Apprehension, you know. A million different right, words. I find all those other words to be cousins of fear. And and fear fear causes a lot of things in life. It it, it causes a lot of problems. Uh, and and it also solves a lot of problems. Without it, uh, we couldn't be great. If we are great, if we ever have a chance to be great, um, or at least to aspire to be great. You couldn't be great without fear because fear allows you to be brave. <laughs> the most important word for me in this whole you know, conversation, right, neighborhood, would be selfishness. Uh, It allows you to be, for a moment, less selfish. One of the things I learned, I guess, partly on my own, everyone thinks my greatest teacher was Cuss. He was a great teacher, but mentor. My greatest teacher was my father, the one who never talked. And um, I realized um, one of the things to be better towards great um, is if you can be submit less than we submit. See, one of the things that I'm afraid of, one of the things I was always quitting in my business, it's kind of not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Every business, I think. Yours <laughs> yours is just more uh, clear. Yeah, it, it hurts more. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> in the moment, at least. Yeah, in the moment. Uh, you're right, 100%, because some things hurt for a long time afterwards. And um, something like regret. Regret is the worst thing in the world because it's a solitary sentence. <laughs> and, and man, oh, man. <laughs> That's a powerful phrase. Regret is a solitary sentence. So oh, boy. I, you're full of good lines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't easy to... Uh, to 
to <laughs> accumulate them. Yeah, and, yeah. And it, was, hard it was a little bit hurtful. But so uh, submit less because we submit every day. And if we can get to a place where we submit or compromise ourselves less, uh, we'll we get to a better place. You know, again, one of the one of the words for me that attaches to things that give you that wind up hurting you in life and have hurt me in life. Uh, one of those boogeyman words is the word of convenience. That's attached to everything. You know, pe people people disappoint you not because they want to disappoint you mm -hmm. or let you down or betray you because they want to betray you. They do it because it's more convenient to do mm -hmm. than, than the other thing. An old man once told me, he said to me, I was trying to I was trying to rationalize something. I was trying to make some an excuse for something. I was trying to make myself better than I was. I was trying to say it was okay. <laughs> and and he just looked at me and he, he he liked me. And he said, Teddy, there ain't no such thing as being a little pregnant. I was like, Yeah. He goes, either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. Either you're Real, you're not real. Either you're, you know, truthful, you're not truthful. Either you're tough or you're not tough. Either you're, either you're, you know, committed or you're not committed. Either you're in or you're out. That applies to a lot of things. Yeah. Including loyalty. <laughs> That's quite a statement. But the light of humanity for me is loyalty. Um, it, it's what goes through the veins of, uh, you know, everything has to have some veins in some form. And if humanity has veins, what runs through the veins of humanity instead of blood to keep it alive is loyalty. Without Those loyalty, words. without loyalty, we're dead. We're freaking walk. We're, we're vessels. I never understood what a ghost ship was. You know what? As I got old, I know what a ghost ship is. It's people. Mm -hmm. It's people that are empty. Mm -hmm. They got no loyalty. Therefore, they got no humanity. Therefore, they got nothing. Therefore, freak them. Freak them. Because, and, and, and you know why they don't have loyalty? Convenience. And you know why? Because it takes, it's hard to be loyal. It's actually hard. Mm -hmm. I'll be a son of a gun. Yeah, you tell me, yeah, it sounds great. Give it to me. Give it to me. Paint me with it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'm loyal. I'm yeah. I'm great. I'm yeah. This is good. I'm ready. I'm on that team. I'm ready. Yeah, Put me in, coach. Yeah. I'm ready. Okay. Now you have to. Uh, you're gonna have to get hurt here. What do you mean get hurt? Oh, well, it's gonna be painful. I mean, to be loyal, you know, you're you're gonna be in danger because the person that you committed your loyalty to for a reason, because obviously you did something in your life, whatever, whatever. Um, you're actually gonna get hurt to be loyal to him. You're actually gonna hold on a minute. Wait, hold on a minute, Coach. Um, hold on, call time out here. Um, <laughs> let me let me think about this, Coach. I'm I'm I might need more more practice. I'm not ready for the game. I'm not ready to go in the game yet. Give me a little more practice, coach. And it hurts to be loyal. It freaking hurts. But without loyalty, we're, we're, we're ghost ships. We got no strength. We got nothing. Yeah. We got nothing. We, we, got, we got nothing. It was a, I guess it was the second time in my life I felt betrayed. Um, the first time was when I, um, you know, I was whatever, young, 17, and I got arrested. I was with all these older guys, tough guys, whatever, and, um, supposedly. And, uh, the detectives separated us, that's what they do. And, um, you know, they... They asked me who did whatever, who's gotten this, that, you know, all that, the particulars of obviously what we did. And, you know, it was me. And um, they said, you sure? You don't want to change that? You want to, because your friends changed it. And and these cops, they were nasty, but they were cops. They were the way, you know, you're going to wind up in Rikers with 
and they're going to be doing this to you. Yeah. And I won't even say the things because then uh, why say them, you know, figure it out. But, uh, you know, they're trying to get what they're trying to get and, you know, you want to change it? And um, no. And, but I felt very betrayed, you know? Yeah. And um, especially when I was standing in the, in the cell <laughs> in Rikers looking at the airplanes leave LaGuardia Airport yeah. and then hoping I was on one. You know, I was making like a deal with God that let me be on one of those planes and let it crash. I'd take a shot. Was part of you proud that you didn't give up your friends? No, because I didn't understand what proud was. I didn't understand nothing. I just understood that. Um, rules are rules. You're just loyal and that's it. I didn't even know there was an option. <laughs> I didn't think there were, I know the cops said you could do this, but that, there was no option. My father never had an option. But the betrayal, the private betrayal was like, and so when Cuz, <laughs> we were partners, me and Cuz. Yeah. Cuz was retired. This stupid kid goes up there and all of a sudden I start training fighters. First I won the gloves, Cuz put me in the gloves, I won the gloves that I had an injury, whatever. But bottom line is, I still want to fight. I want to turn pro, I want to fight. That was the plan. And um, and Cuz had a different plan. Cuz, Cuz was like, you can't. And he had it set up a little bit. Whatever. Without getting into it. Hey, he did me a favor. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think he knew he was doing me a favor. And you know what? I do think he was. Mm -hmm. He was doing himself a little bit one too. But, it, but he was doing it for the greater cause. Because he believed in this thing of boxing. He he believed that it changed lives. He believed that it was worthwhile. Yeah. He believed that there was a power to it beyond the left hook. The big picture of boxing. Yeah. He believed in it. Yeah, he believed that to be a champion, you had to be special. You had to be smart. You had to have character. You had uh, that. You had to be a better person, and that you couldn't make a champion if you didn't make him a better person first. Mm -hmm. And and that that this you know this could strengthen people. The, the sport could strengthen people in those ways. So he he was married to it, and he he was old, and he needed, there was no one in the gym. It was empty, and it was above a police station, which was crazy, and he needed an heir to the throne. He needed to pass it on to someone, and he saw something. And all of a sudden, he said he saw that my career as a boxer was less important than having me become his heir to the throne and become his trainer, his man, his guy, yeah. to continue. <laughs> that we could do a lot more for him and for 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 everyone, not just for him, but for everyone. It was more like to keep it going, like yeah. like it couldn't die. It couldn't die, and the cousin was afraid that it would die with him. And he committed his whole life to it. He didn't get married because of boxing, so he didn't. So he saw me as, as you know, the the little bit of you know, the seed to plant for for more things to grow, yeah. uh, before that plant died. And so he all of a sudden he says, "You can't fight." And I had people tell me that I could go somewhere else and fight. Mm -hmm. And I could, mm -hmm. but I couldn't, right? Because I'd be disloyal. Loyalty is everything. Yeah, so I couldn't leave Cus. Yeah, and he kind of knew that, and and so uh, you know I couldn't leave him. And he said, "You have an ability to teach." He said, "Knowledge means nothing." He said, "See these Britannica." He had Britannica, Britannica encyclopedias, uh, the whole set in mm -hmm. in our library. He said, "You see these?" Yeah, I see them. All the knowledge of the world, whatever, uh, is in these. All right. Means nothing if you don't have somebody to convey it to people. Otherwise, it just sits on a bookshelf and looks good. He goes, you have the ability to convey knowledge to people. You're a teacher. You were born to be a teacher. You'd lessen yourself by only being a champion fighter mm -hmm. because you'd only take care of one person. Mm -hmm. You could take care of all kinds of people. And you could do this, and you could do that, and you could do this. So we go on this venture. It took a minute, because I didn't believe him at first. But finally, we I am. I'm there. I'm training fighters. And then he, he gets me to buy in. And I, I was a teacher, and I start teaching these kids, and there's no one in the gym that's dead. 
And all of a sudden, there's 10 kids, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, Catskill Boxing Club, which was never there. Now it's there. And I'm training fighters. I'm taking them down to South Bronx to get experience. One of his former fighters, Nelson Cuevas, down to South Bronx. I'm taking down there to get smokers, to get fights when they're ready. After I teach, I'm wearing out dungarees. I'm getting holes in my dungarees. I was fashionable before it was fashionable to have holes in my dungarees. Yes. I could have made a lot of money with that yeah. because I was on my knees You're with these little kids, nine years old, 10 years old, yeah. eight years old, 10, 12, 13, 14, mm -hmm. all these kids. And, and I'm teaching him and I'm building a gym. And Cus only came once a week because he was semi-retired, you know. And and he's home. And when he would come once a week, he knew. He couldn't give me money, but he gave me more than money. He gave me praise. Mm -hmm. oh. And he said, look what Atlas is doing. He's creating champions. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm, yeah. I'm doing good. Yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden, after four years of that, because I was up there seven years, eight years, eight years. After about three and a half, four years of that, we get a phone call that they got this kid in prison and try on prison uh, from one of the guys that knew Cus, Matt Peransky, uh, and and there's a state, there's a correction officer named Bobby Stewart who used to box, and Cus had helped him out a little bit, a little bit, and um, and they knew we had this gym now that was really starting to become something because we were winning tournaments and everything else. They called up and said, hey, we got this kid, Mike Tyson. He, he's, he's 12 years old. He's 190 pounds. And he's a mess. But Bobby Stewart got involved with him, uh, you know, the, the former fighter, and he's taken a liking to it. And now where he didn't behave at all and he didn't listen to anyone, now he's listening because Bobby's got a carrot, and the carrot is hit, hit teacher boxing, and now he, he's at the point now where we we want you to take a look, you and Teddy. All right, bring him down. What did you think when you first saw Mike Tyson? Well, I, I want to I see his birth certificate, because he 190 pounds, 12 years old, and all solid. Yeah. Um, you know, really? But, yeah. Just physically, just as a physical yeah. specimen. And, and, and Big guy. Yeah, and listen... Cuz was right. I was a teacher. He was right. And he was testing me even that day. He said, what do you think? So I said, well, we ain't going to know nothing hitting the bag. Who the frick cares about that? He knocked the bag down. Yeah, we got to put him in. With uh, We got no one to put him in that way. I didn't have anyone that way. We got to test him. Everyone's got to be tested. And um, so you got to put him in responsibly. But let's put him in. Just respond. But let's put him in with Bobby Stewart, former pro fighter. Had fourteen pro fights, smaller than Tyson. Uh, he was when he was fighting. He was one seventy five. But still, he's twenty eight years old. Tyson's twelve. Come on, and and he'll work with him, mm -hmm. right? So we do. We put him in. Tyson. He recognized the moment. He understood this was an audition. This was a chance. You know, this was that TV show, change your life, and. He understood that if he passed the audition, he could change, possibly change his life. He wasn't sure what. How could he be sure what exactly? But it was better than what he had. And so he was on audition. So he wanted, he innately understood what we would want to see. Mm -hmm. Ferociousness, toughness, uh, character, uh, desire, you know, and of course ability. Mm -hmm. Well, we saw the ability, power, speed. But it was it was unbridled, it was untaught, it was it was raw. He didn't know really much at all, um, at all. But we saw that. But he wanted to show more. He knew that wasn't enough. Again, innate intelligence. He he had to show desire. He had to show toughness. And so, I was being responsible. After two rounds, that's enough. Normally, I don't put a guy into boxing until maybe four months, five months, six months, eight months, ten months. It depends what it takes to learn on the floor before it's responsible to put him in the ring to, to actually take on uh, incoming real live shells mm -hmm. instead of blanks. Yeah. And so normally, I wouldn't have him in. And I knew after today, he wouldn't be in the ring again if I trained him. I would teach him first, and then he'd get back in in a few months. But for this day, it was the only way. It, it, it's kind of like I used to make this analogy, and Cus loved it. I, I, he said, "What's training a fighter? What do you what, what do you look for training a fighter, Teddy?" You know, he asked me these ridiculous questions just to test me. 
And, and I say, it's like going to Macy's with, I, oh, he loved it. I, I said, it's like, <laughs> I said, it's like going to Macy's window on Christmas. He goes, what do you mean Macy's window? You know, cause yeah. it was like, uh, yeah. boom, boom, boom. So what do you mean Macy's window? Oh, you go to Macy's window and they get the window with everything you want to see. Yeah. Everything in there. And it looks great. Oh, the, the, everything. And yeah. And then what? Well, then you ask what's in the warehouse and they tell you nothing. <laughs> Yeah. And then Cus says, that's it. That's a trainer. Yeah. And I wanted to see what was in the warehouse. Because I saw what was in the, uh, Macy's window. I saw the power. I saw the speed. So he goes two rounds, and he gets a bloody nose. Here's the weird thing. Not weird. Very telling. We knew what we were doing. Not bragging, but we knew what we were doing. Because he got a bloody nose because he got hit. After that bloody nose, he never got another bloody nose. You know why? He didn't get hit. Because he learned. He was still strong, but he was smarter now. Anyway, he goes two rounds, and I saw, and I'm being responsible because if he goes more, it's not responsible. I saw what I needed to see. I saw speed, I saw power, I saw athleticism, and I saw, I didn't believe him. I thought he was lying to me. I'm just telling you. I, I thought he was lying, trying to act tough when he wasn't really feeling tough. It didn't matter. Cuz questioned me on it afterwards. What did you see? And when I said, he goes, Young master, you know, again, he wasn't paying me money. So he had to give me something, right? And co and that was better than, that was currency. Young master, I'm yeah. the young master, whoa. You know, young master, you know what I mean? I, I felt like that guy Kung Fu, you know, yeah. like in the movie. Like Kung Fu, grasshopper, when you're ready, when you can take this out of my hand, you can leave. And That's powerful. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it worked. Cuz <laughs> knew how to work me. <laughs> and he did. And and it worked. And And so... But you know what? I didn't mind being worked. I kind of knew I was being shuffled a little bit. Yeah, Cuz got the job done, but he did it his way. And, and he did it for a lot of a myriad of reasons. And But at the end of the day, it was all good. And I, I just had to understand that eventually uh, later on. But And you do the same. You do things your way. And carry some of him in you, some of your father in you. Yeah. That day, you know, that day was funny because when Cus said, what did you see, Teddy, with him? Well, after two rounds, I got up in the ring. I knew I was going to train him. Obviously, we weren't going to say no. <laughs> and he still had about four months to serve, and we were going to work it out. Yeah. And when I got up on the ring apron, that's my gym. I'm the boss. You know, people later on in life call me a dictator. You know what I said? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I didn't deny. People thought, you you, uh, you mean I'm right? Yeah, I'm a dictator. I'm a trainer. I'm the boss. Yeah. I'm in charge. Yeah. If I, uh, You wouldn't be here if I wasn't. Yeah. What the fuck you need me for if I'm not freaking in charge? You idiot. Yeah, yeah, damn right. I'm, uh, well, what do you think? It's a, it's a shared responsibility? No, it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's why you're here. Yeah, I am in charge. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be here if you don't understand that. So I get up there and I know that I'm going to be training him. I got to show him who the boss is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm being really frank about this. So I get up there and say, that's it, out. Yeah. No, no. You know, this is Tyson. Yeah. No, let me go. I want to do another round. I want to do another round. I, want... I said, out. Did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Because I knew that, you know, he was going to test me. He was testing me. Mm -hmm. I, I, said, I said, get out. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got out. But were you impressed with the fact that you want to keep going or not? Yes, and I recognized what it really was. So Cus asked me, what was that? Cus mm -hmm. wanted to know what the young master saw. So Cus said, what was that? Mm -hmm. I said, it was um, it was an act. He goes, you saw that? Did he really want to go? I said, no. I said, he didn't really want to go. But he knew that we want him to go, and he made himself ready to go in order to satisfy it. And that's just as good. And Cus said, damn right, it's just as good. All that matters was not not, not how he got there, but that he got there. Yeah. That's all that matters, that he got there, that he got to the place to act like a fighter, to, to do what we want him to do, to be ready to persevere, to go beyond the comfort level, mm -hmm. to do another round. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to. Damn right he didn't want to. But... He knew we want him to, and he knew in order to pass the test, he had to do it. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're right. He goes, now it's going to be your job to teach him, to make him a fighter that don't get bloody noses, 
that don't get hit and will get to that place without being coerced to get there, to get to that place on his own instead of using the things that he had to use to get to that place today. Those things are not going to be available one day when you, and listen to this, you talk about a man being prophetic, because it was pretty good. Uh, you talk about man being on a job, on money, Lex. He says, how do you think he finishes the sentence? He goes, because someday, you, because, you know, you're going to have to make sure that he learns these things. Because, you know, he, he'll be your first heavyweight champ. I, what did you just say? <laughs> he's 12 years old. Yeah. yeah. If he, he's been arrested 30 times. Yeah. He's getting out of jail, out of, you know, uh, juvenile detention, try on. <laughs> um, he's a mess in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things we find out later, a lot of problems, weaknesses. So he goes, and you have, that's part of your job. That'll be part of your job. And, but he really said that. He, and then, then he turned to him, he goes, you want to come live with us, young man? You want to be a fighter? Yes. And even that, Cus said to me later, what do you think about that? I said, hey, the way he said yes. The, yeah, the way he said yes. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. And he said, what do you think about that? And, I, and I, we're talking. I said, he ain't going to be that polite in a, in a little while down the road. Uh, again, he knew that that's what he felt that he needed to to project himself as, to to present himself as, to, to get to where he wanted to get to. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you see what Cus was seeing in terms of the heavyweight champion of the world? No. Again, the easiest answer would be yes. Teddy, <laughs> Teddy Alice, genius. Wow, wow. Teddy, wow. Yeah. No, 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 no. But again, it was my job. Yeah. And I just, I my job. It was simple, simpler than Cus's. Cus knew too much. I knew nothing. I just knew, you know, rudiments of boxing. I knew what it took to be a fighter, and and how to execute it, the steps of executing it. So I took those steps. The 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 rest of it, you get blurred by those other things. I wasn't blurred by those other things. I, it, was, it was just get him in the gym, make him mentally stronger, make him face things, and teach him how to slip punches <laughs> and, and create holes and fill those freaking holes yeah. with devastating punches. This is a cuss. And what are you going to do? I'm going to teach him to fill holes and fill them with punches with bad intentions. Yeah. And and that became the moniker. Yeah. Uh, and then Tyson would say that. I'm, I'm throwing punches with bad intentions. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are. And, um, you know. The most important part of the job to make him face things. Yeah. Make him face where he's lying to himself, where he's submitting. What if we start this conversation with yeah. submission? Yeah. Submit less. Yeah. Submit less. Submit less every day. Submit less. Because only come to the gym once in a while. And if I had him sparring, he would come because that was his that was his project. That was the heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Now he came. You know, put his life in cuz. Mm -hmm. Cuz had life. He, he was losing a little life. But that made the light bulb bright again. It did. And it was great to see. I felt proud of that. I felt connected to that. And that's why when 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 it all went bad. And Cus took the side that the only side he could take, the side of the next heavyweight champ of the world. But he, but he left me, his partner, the young master. And for the second time, I get betrayed, and I'm like, for a while, I thought everything Cus taught me, said to me, was a liar. I didn't want to be any part of it anymore. Until I got a little more mature, and I got a little past that where I was able to understand, I was able to understand that just because somebody that you perceived as great in every area is you find to be weak in certain areas doesn't mean that they can't still be what they want to you. It's... It's something that it's something that can be understood or forgiven. It, it's hard. It's hard to get to that place to forgive somebody in that kind of way that I felt betrayed because 
Cuz told me the most important thing was loyalty. Cuz told me he loved me because I was loyal. Cuz Cuz told people that the reason that he went to court was because I didn't give up anybody, even though it meant putting me in the risk of going to jail for 10 years. And he and Cuz felt that he admired those traits. And so I assumed that he he would show the same traits. And he took a deal. He took a deal. He took a deal. He 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 signed the papers that those that those so called feds of mine signed. You know, he 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 took a deal to to uh, you know to to have the future heavyweight champ as it turned out, uh, and and to let me you know to let me go to sign the deal to to let me take you know take the weight. I served my purpose. I got him to the way he needed to get. Um, brought life back in the gym. If I wasn't in the gym at that particular time, Tyson never would have been in the gym. There would have been no gym to bring him to. Mm -hmm. When they called up and made that phone call to bring him to the gym, there would have been no activity. There would have been no boxing program. There would have been, you know, no trainer training him 24-7 the way I was, where Cus wasn't capable of doing that at that point in his life. Yeah. But then again, it's not poor Teddy. I get the benefit of a career. I get the benefit of knowledge. I get the benefit of a life. I get the benefit of learning, of of becoming hopefully a better person. Um, I get the benefit of being betrayed again. Um, but well, that's a hell of a statement right there. I don't know what the benefit of that is. You can learn to forgive weakness. You know. When you realize how how easy it is to be weak, and and when you realize that, somebody asked me, "How did you get to the point where you you could forgive?" Right? It's a pretty good question, pretty simple, pretty basic, pretty important, right? And I didn't I didn't understand. I understood, but I did understand immediately for me. I said, how can I not forgive somebody? It becomes easier to learn how to forgive when you're still trying to forgive yourself. When you're still in the process of trying to forgive yourself for all your own inherent weaknesses and betrayals of people like my father in different ways that we forget very easily because it's handy. And it's a way of surviving. It's a lot easier to to figure it out, rationalize it, to 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 find forgiveness when you realize that you still haven't figured out completely how to forgive yourself. I'm still trying to figure that out. And um so that helped me figure out how to forgive cuss. Because to figure out how to forgive me, I had to understood why I did these things, where the, where the weaknesses came from, where the selfishness came from, where the convenience came from, that they really existed. But they didn't exist for malice. They existed for me not being prepared to understand that I could be stronger, to want to be stronger. And then I looked at Cus. He wanted to be stronger, but he got to a point in life where he had been strong for a lot of his life. Mm -hmm. He was strong with me. He was strong with a lot of things in his life. And does everyone deserve a pass in life where he got he got to a place where everything was in one basket, the basket of boxing? He once told me that he never got married because it would be un, it would have been selfish to a woman to have gotten married when his whole life was boxing, that he couldn't give to a kid, he couldn't give to her. He could, and, and then I thought about it. He had no money, really. And Jim Jacobs and Bill Caden took care of the bills, so he didn't really need money that way. But the one, what was the payoff for that kind of life, that kind of commitment, that kind of sacrifice? Really, what was the payoff? The payoff was to have champions. 
to have a champion that would keep your name alive. You know, that word legacy, like what does it mean? Sometimes it's it's just a word. Sometimes it's it's more than a word. It, it's 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 a reprieve. It's a pension plan. It is is being given a pension on your way out for the rest of your life. For for your life wherever you're going. Yeah. You're going to wherever you're going for eternity. Um it, it's 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 the only thing that you take with you is what you left behind. And for Cus, it was all about leaving behind a mark, a mark that of champion. Yeah, it was attached to ego. We all have it. Yeah, it was attached to some selfishness and all. But yeah, it was also attached to wanting to leave something great behind, yeah. to know that you were part of it, that you existed for a reason. That 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 you sacrificed for a reason, and all that freaking pain I brought my father. I was searching for something. Yeah, I made it into a righteous search. I made it into I did, and I made it into I, I, it was okay because it was righteous, and I. But it still did damage. It still did damage. It still hurt people. It still betrayed my father's trust. And. Cus betrayed mine, but he didn't do it maliciously. He he did it out of again. My father came home. This is how I'm gonna connect it. My father came home from from work one night, twelve o'clock, and I was waiting up. And like I said, I was over nine, ten years old. And he got mad at me. He goes, Go to bed, what are you doing up? I said, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. And um he said, well, go to bed. I said, no, I, 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 what, what were you doing? He said, I was at the hospital. You were there, why were you there so late? You know, <laughs> he answered me. He, he said, there was a patient. There was a sick patient. I said, uh, he must be better now because you're his doctor, you know, because my father could fix anything. And my father, nothing got in the way of the truth. Nothing, nothing. Even blown his son's bubble. Matter of factly, he said to me, uh, "No, he's not going to get better. He's going to die." And um, so as a nine-year-old kid, you know, you're a kid, you're selfish, you know, not in a bad way, but you know, you want what you. And I said, um, I said two things. First, I said, "How? How? You're his doctor." How? I mean, it can't be. And then I said, I I just said it almost angry. Then why were you there? Like, you should have been here with me. Yeah. And you know what he said to me? Because you don't give up on life. Go to bed. And don't give up on life. And that's, I finally connected the dots. This idiot that didn't graduate high school. <laughs> I finally connected the dots. I was asking Cus to give up on life. You know, you don't give up on life. You don't give up on aspirations of life. Life is all forms of life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a physical form of it. It's life. It's having a reason to be alive. It's having a reason to have tomorrow. And and Cus's only reason to have tomorrow was to have another heavyweight champ. Yeah, and champ. Teddy Atlas, even though we were together all those years and we were partners and we trained together and we would we would you know the only thing we didn't do was what they did in the Indian movies where where they cut the finger and they became blood brothers. Yeah, that's that's the only thing we didn't yeah. do, and I felt like we did that. Yeah, without cutting, and. And, and, and now here we are, and, still. and he freaking betrayed me. This, and and um, and then all of a sudden I connected the dots. I was like, he didn't betray me in the in that cold sense. He didn't, didn't give, up give up on, on life. life. <laughs> uh. I want to be the great gracious guy right now. <laughs> Say. Oh, I'm so hum human that that you know uh, a man's man enough to say sorry. That's it. Uh, we're good.
I want to be really that that's 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 the that's the best presentation of Teddy Atlas I could put out there. He's a good guy. He forgives. He he's a good guy. He's a he's a he's a stand up guy and he's a good guy. I'm not sure. If he truly did it for himself, that he really did it because he felt that it was true. But but if he's persuaded by other things, he was in the middle. I know I'm taking it too deep. I know it, but what am I going to do? He was in the middle of 12 steps with the, you know, getting out of drugs, alcohol, 12 steps, which is a commemorable thing. Really, it is. And and he's taking the steps. And part of the steps was to admit or to apologize to all people you offended in life. Okay. But are you doing it for the 12 steps or are you doing it because you really, truly have come to terms with believing what you did was that hurtful to me and that it matters to you that it was that hurtful to me and that you were wrong in doing it. Did you do it for... I know that's deep. I know that I'm a freaking idiot. I'm a, you're, you're, you're a teddy. Freaking, you're, you're, you should be better than that. He's better than you. Yeah, maybe he is better than me. Maybe he is. Really, seriously, maybe he is. And and I took it. He put his hand. I took it. I We hugged. He said, I love you. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I, but I want to believe, but what did Cuz tell me? No matter what a man says, it's what he does in the end that he intended to do all along. So to this day today, was it really genuine or was it reflexive of that moment for him to get what he needed to, you know, for that step or was it truly for what I needed to to really that he really cared that he, what he did to me caused me to do what I did because I did something that was pretty damn bad to him too is he able to deal with that and put that where it has to be put is he able to put that or or is it just he did something he had to do and maybe he's sorry he did it I know I'm look, I appreciate it that he, I would have rather been in a private place. Yeah, he's emotional. I get emotional a little bit too. But but he he's emotional and he can be, and he can be, I can see why people have a fascination and a love affair with him right now. Because he was, because, you know, he was, he was the meteor, the meteor that went across the sky. That is, if they didn't see it, their parents told them about it. There was a meteor that came across the sky one day, yeah. and 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 the meteor is walking around in the room now, and that's the meteorite. And then and it actually landed here, and and that's it right there. And 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 now he's come a long way, and now he's you know he's more human, and and he he's lovable, you know, and and uh, compassionate, and he cries, and and I get the fascination, I get the love affair, I get it, because we're inherently we're people that want to forgive, we're people that we want to be good, we and part of being good is to forgive people and to to show compassion to people, and so and when somebody's been damaged, uh to acknowledge they've been damaged, to acknowledge that you know they've been damaged and you care about them being damaged. And how do you show care? Through admiration. You know, in in some ways, almost through adulation. And he's getting adulation from people, like, you know, uh, which is to an incredible level. And it's because it's a phenomenon. But but I get it. I understand it. And um, I don't know if he gets it. I don't know if underneath all of this, he's a complex guy. He's a sensitive guy. I don't know, and I am too. Yeah. And <laughs> one complex guy talking about another complex guy. I don't know if underneath it all, where he's really truly at, as far as that day that he said that to me. Is there part of you that's sorry to Mike for pulling, I'm not sorry. pulling I, the gun I, on him? Yeah, and that's listen. That's fair. I I know dimensions of. 
human nature too well. To not know that he still has to have certain, because I have those strong feelings. What? It's not fair for him to have them? Damn right it's fair. Mm-hmm. Now, now he could look at it if, if he was to be held to his word that night, that he just acknowledges that what happened he deserved because of what he, you know, the position he put me in and he put himself in, what he did. And I wouldn't change nothing. You know, still, you're, you don't regret pulling the gun on him. I regret that I had to. Yeah, I regret very much that that I had to. That I regret very much. I'm, he crossed the line. I hated him for putting me in that position. That that you know, how dare he think that that somebody's feelings are that trivial? That the way I would feel about myself and the way the girl would feel about herself that was eleven years old at the time, how she would feel about herself. How how dare that he think it's that trivial that you know. That I shouldn't be ready to freaking to both die and kill for that. Yeah. Why didn't Customato see it in a deeper way and talk he, through he it? The word came back to me, but of course, what does it mean? But the word came back to me that Cus said you were right. But if he took the side of Teddy, he would destroy a, a potentially a great a great fighter. <laughs> was afraid to to go there where he used to not be afraid because it's kind of like you're never afraid of going up and i i get it you know when i train a fighter now if i come out of retirement i train a fighter now i feel in camp like i'm i feel like i'm on death row every day that that if every day I I try to retrace my memory and say, did I feel this way when I was younger? I, I don't remember feeling this way. I feel every day a dreadful feeling that if I don't get this right, I I I've betrayed everything. I betrayed the fighter's trust. Mm-hmm. I betrayed uh, what I'm supposed to be. And then one, one day I tried to figure it out. Why do I feel this way? It's so intense. I was in camp for two months training a guy for the world title a couple few years ago, um, fighting the hardest puncher in the world at the time, and um, Adonis Stevenson, and the fighter was Ukrainian, and I was, you know, brought in to train him for that fight, and he trusted me and changed his whole style. Trusted me. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I went to bed every night, like, praying, um, dread, waking up dread, my stomach down to here, every day, saying, what what if I fail him? What 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 if everything that I told him was going to happen don't happen? What if I fail him? What what if he trusted me and I, I betrayed that trust? And the thing was the what cuss was, you know, he used to be stronger than that. And then I I tried to figure it out why I got this way, and why it was so dreadful to me, and why I felt like I was on death row every day training a fighter. Like, did I do enough? Did I do right? Well. Well, will we accomplish what we will we accomplish what I promised him we would accomplish? Mm-hmm. Would I keep my word? And and then I started thinking, what, how did I become this weak? <laughs> how did I freaking become? I was a pretty strong freaking guy. Yeah. How did I become this weak? And then finally, I think I figured it out. You know why? Mm-hmm. Because I was always working to get up. But once I finally got up, now I was looking down, and I finally hit me. I said, I didn't want to lose. I said there was nothing to lose on my way up. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden there's something to lose when you're up there and you're looking down. And that's where he was. And, and that's he where Cus was. Cus was at the end of his rope. He he was he accomplished the two world champs, all this stuff, right? Everything. He and 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 he did it right. Now all of a sudden it wasn't about moving forward. It was about not falling down. Holy cow. I was like, I got it, Cus. I got it. I got it. You didn't want to fall down. Oh my God, you didn't want to fall. And he, this was his last chance. You don't give up on life. This was his last chance to live forever, to to make everything he did worthwhile, to have the youngest, heavy, it wasn't just heavyweight champ. You got to remember, mm-hmm. he was the youngest heavyweight champ ever. And to have that, it was okay to die now. Mm-hmm. And, How's loyalty to someone named Teddy Atlas gonna 
get in the way of that. That's a tidal wave that there ain't no wall that's been made high enough to stop that tidal wave. And now I'll stop myself. Yeah, there is. Mm -hmm. But but it would have to be an awful big one. And you know what? Who are we to say that we could ever build that wall that big? Who is any of it? Who am I to say? If I answer the way I feel, I, I, then then I'm you know I'm making myself John Wayne again. You don't have to and, answer that. You know, I think loyalty loyalty is important. No matter what a man says, it's what he does in the end that he intends to do all, do all along. I didn't make that up, custard. And and when when this all went down. Those words came freaking echoing into my freaking ears. I didn't want them. Cotton doesn't help. And they freaking kept coming into my ears. And what do you think? Still an immature kid at the time. You know, I was young. Still an immature kid at the time. What the freak do you think my response was? You were full of... Yeah. And sure. But I got past that. Do you do you forgive Cus? Have you found forgiveness? Listen, I forgive him because he gave me more than he took away from me. Mm -hmm. If I can, what kind of man am I? To, if I can at least acknowledge that and be grateful for that, he I, he he gave me more than he took from me, and um, I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for what I gave him. That I had, you know that I, I did give him some and um, at that point in his life you know uh, a place a place to still to still have test tubes and um, chemistry experiments mm -hmm. you know a laboratory where he could still create great fire mm -hmm. and I, I helped give him that I helped I, helped, I was part of that lab and making sure that lab was there and um, just that there was the existence of test tubes um, in the place because you can't freaking do experiments without test tubes. No, you're the scientist with the test tubes. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. And um, I, I just hope that um, what I said earlier is is really is really my thread through this whole thing. When you say, "Can you forgive Cus?" Um, I, I'm still trying to forgive myself, and if if I can have hope that I can forgive myself, I think that hope has to start with the power to forgive someone else. How can I ever forgive myself for all my failings and figure it out if I can't start and practice it? by forgiving someone else for some shortcomings. And for me, that's, that's, that's the only sense of sometimes a very hard thing to make sense of. That, that, that's my North Star. <laughs> that's, that's my compass. Cuz used to make me laugh. You know, me and him did everything together. We drive, and we get lost in the city. We get lost in the Bronx, yeah. and he get all frustrated. And he said, "Atlas, you're a great trainer, but you turn you around, you spin you around, and you're lost." And I said, "Me or we?" <laughs> and because I was the only one who would argue with him, yeah. and and it was really funny sometimes. Yeah. And I said, "We or me? Yeah. You or we or?" And he goes, "I, I don't care, Cuz." You're lost. <laughs> I'm lost. What are you talking about? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Cus couldn't give in. He just couldn't admit. He couldn't give in. You know what he said to me? Uh, all of a sudden, he goes, when I was in the Army, if, if I had a compass, I could get out of the woods. I said, we're not in the woods. We're not in the Army. We don't have a compass. Cus, <laughs> Cus, yeah. uh, just try, uh, don't argue with me. I, one time we're driving. <laughs> I, wa I want to get back to Catskill. We we just finished at the Bronx. <laughs> it's been a long day, yeah. Uh, you know, visiting the the murderers Inc. Uh, houses and everything else that that he took me through for the eighteen hundred time, and um, and he would fall asleep. You know, he was getting older, and he 
and he would just fall asleep in the car. So what do you think? I went a little faster, right? Mm -hmm. Because before he went to sleep, he said, don't speed. Mm -hmm. So I don't consider myself, I try to be an honest guy, and I try to be a freaking, but, yeah. Yeah, you know. It was a five or six guys. What did I say earlier? <laughs> try to do less submitting. Yeah. Really, in all phases, try to submit a little less. Try to lie a little less today. Mm -hmm. A little less. Try to get stronger. Try to get a little better. Mm -hmm. So here we are, and we're, we're driving, and all of a sudden he's, I, I, what did I do, 80, 75? Probably. Yeah. Probably did. You know, whatever. And um, all of a sudden he wakes up. You were speeding. Oh, I lie. No, I wasn't. Don't lie. I'm not lying. <laughs> you lied again. Hey, you were speeding. Mm -hmm. Now, come on. This guy, he's, you know what I mean? He's, he's, he's unbelievable. So I got a freaking, you know, he's the, he, he's David Copperfield. I want to know the trick. Yeah. I want to know how he freaking, he made this thing disappear. Mm -hmm. So I said, what are you talking, how do you know? He goes, because I timed you. I looked at the post number and I'm like, what? I looked at the post <laughs> number on the side of the road yeah. where we were, Brilliant. whatever mile that, and, and I never knew they even existed. Yeah. I look and I said, yeah, there's little numbers. He started timing. And, and he I goes, fell asleep. yeah. I, he timed it. And he looked, he goes, we couldn't have got from here to there yeah. in that amount of time unless you were going 75 miles an hour. Brilliant. And I'm like, all right, I'm smart man. All right, I'm impressed. Uh, you know, don't try to get the mileage, the mile per hour part right. It's enough that you got me. Yeah, yeah, that's enough. I'm, uh, yeah. I said, and I, I'm not gonna do that no more. I'm, you know, and and just he helped me in crazy ways where there would be times where I wanted to be, you know, where you wanted to be whatever, right? Convenient, weak. Submit right, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Cus in my mind, Cus was there with the stopwatch, <laughs> and and I'd be like, you know, uh, no, you know, where I was about to say yeah. yes to whatever that yeah. particular situation was. Uh. I think so. <laughs> I, I think so. So far, yeah. You know, I can only go like so far. It's kind of like that old joke, you know, where the guy jumps off the Empire State Building, yeah, he's falling down, <laughs> and he's going, you know, 80th floor, yeah. 70th floor, 60th yeah. floor, 50, and he gets past the 50th floor, and they're looking him out the window, and he goes, "How am I doing? Like, so far, so good." <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know where it's gonna end, but um. I don't know if he was ever great. I know he was sensational. I know he was the greatest mix of maybe speed and power ever. Mm. I know he was one of the greatest punches from either side of the plate, left or right. There's been great punches with just the right hand, like Ernie Chavis and Deontay Wilder mm -hmm. and Max Bear. I don't know if there's ever been anyone who could punch as good as he did on either side with either hand other than Joe Lewis and a few others. I don't know if there's ever been such a combination of speed and power to that pure level that he had, and it was a pure level. I don't know if there was ever as good a fighter as Tyson was for maybe one night he was great, where he wasn't tested, but he might have been ready to be tested that one night against Michael Spinks. Mm -hmm. When he took him apart 90 seconds, I think I saw a great fighter that night. I don't think you can be great unless you have all the requirements of being great. Not rely on someone else's weakness to be strong. To be strong on your own. Too often he relied on other people's weakness, whether it's to, by being intimidated or whether it was <laughs> because his talent was so much greater than theirs that it was like putting a monster truck in there with a Volkswagen, and the Volkswagen was gonna get crushed. No matter how much horsepower the Volkswagen might have had under the hood and you put under the hood, <laughs> it was gonna get crushed. The monster truck was not gonna allow it to be a contest. 
And to be able to find a way when your talent wasn't enough. He didn't find a way when his talent wasn't enough. And he, and I'm not making statements if I'm not ready to put some evidence, you know, like if we were in a courtroom, Exhibit A, um, when he fought when he fought Buster Douglas, um, Buster Douglas matched his will and didn't get intimidated, stood up to him. He didn't do what most people did. He didn't submit even a little bit. Not that night. He had in the past, but that night he didn't. Why? Because Buster had, Buster had a secret weapon that night, his mother. Buster's mother had died a few months previous. He loved his mother very much. Buster had always had talent, big heavyweight, talented, could punch, <laughs> technically solid. <laughs> he was all those things, always was, but he quit in fights. He, he, he did less than he should have done. He never lived up to his ability. He gave in. He submitted. He wasn't strong enough. He never had a reason to be strong enough. When his mother died, he had a reason. Nothing could hurt him as much as his mother dying hurt him, Mike Tyson included. That night, Mike Tyson could not hurt him as much as his mother had hurt him by dying. That night, he had a reason to be strong for his mother. And he was strong. He was everything he was supposed to be <laughs> and more. And he stood up to Mike. And Mike, for the first time, maybe ever, was in a fight where he had to overcome something, where he had to be more than talented, more than a puncher, more than a guy with scintillating speed. And he wasn't. And then that night got followed by another night with Holyfield. Holyfield wasn't as talented as him, as big as a much a puncher. But Holyfield had the character. He was strong in ways that Tyson wasn't strong. He was strong in a way where he could find a way. He was willing to find a way. He's willing to go to the cliff. To, to truly die before he submitted. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff is just words. <laughs> yeah, they're going to have to carry me out on the shield. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. Yeah, until it comes time to be carried out on the shield. Sometimes there's people that actually mean it. Mm -hmm. You think Mike and didn't Holy have that? Uh, well, all right. He Let's just say arbitrarily, I don't have his record for me. <laughs> let's say he was 55 and 5. I know he had about five losses. All right, let's say he was 55 and 5, right? A lot of knockouts. I have a saying. A fight's not a fight until there's something to overcome. Until then, it's just an athletic uh, exhibition, contest. Yeah, who's a better athlete? <laughs> who's got more quick twitch fibers? Who's, who, who's more developed? Who's in better this? Who's, uh, who's more developed in those physical areas? But a fight is not a fight until there's something to overcome. Okay. So if you go by my definition, not Webster's, my definition, which I think means something. Mike Tyson was only in five fights in his life. The five fights where there was something to overcome, and he didn't overcome it. Now, I know people hate me for this, <laughs> including Tyson. I, I understand him. Hate me. Oh, you're a hater. Because you weren't with him. You didn't make the money because this, because that, because you got betrayed. <laughs> I think I'm better than that. I hope I'm better than that. I believe I'm better than that. I'm not a hater. I've, I've broadcast fights for 25 years on ESPN where there were some people in the corner I did not like. And if they did a good job, this guy's doing a great job. And then there were guys that I liked and I had friendship. I, he, he, he messed up. And we weren't friends no more. Friendship got to be tested. Remember that? So we weren't friends no more. But why did I do that? Because it was my job. It was more important for me. When, when it's all over with, the only thing you're left with is, I mean, we're going to be dust, all of us, right? The only thing we're left with is what carries on, our reputation. Uh, you know, legacy, whatever that is. But our reputation. That's all we're left with. And that's all our kids are left with. I want it to be as good as it can be. I've always had an ability. 
I've done a lot of things wrong, and I've had a lot of lackings. <laughs> but the one strength I've had, if I had a strength, is to understand somehow, through osmosis, I guess, to learn the lesson that was important is not what's in front of you for those five seconds, for that moment in life. It's what's left behind you when those five seconds are gone. When that, what, whatever it is that you're dealing with, you know, whatever the that moment is, whatever they, that moment, what you do in that moment, the action of that moment is going to stay with you and be you. It's going to become you. <laughs> what what you face for that moment, it's gone. It's it's gone in the air in an instant. It's gone. It's done. Whether you take whether you stand up there and you get shot in the head. <laughs> And the guy freaking blows your brains out, or you freaking you you stand up here, or you're fighting a guy who's like an un, a scary guy to fight, but you fight him and you beat him, or he beats you up. But how you represented yourself in that moment is all that matters. That's gonna live. What happened don't matter. It don't matter that you got shot in the head. I know that sounds absurd. But if you believe that it was important to stand up and have, take the chance to get shot in the freaking head rather than to live like an empty vessel, you know what? Th that's all that freaking matters. And somehow that got freaking wrapped into this freaking head of mine. Like, that's what matters. That's all that matters. You know how many times I went and I... I there were things, whether it was with this one, with Tyson, with that. I, I didn't want to be there. I was scared to death. But I was more scared. I, I was more scared. I'm living with regret. How I would have felt. Yeah. I don't want to be in solitary confinement the rest of my life <laughs> with that freaking guy in the cell next to me called regret. Yeah. I don't freaking want to be next to that guy. Yeah. If I want to freaking go down that road, I'll watch Papillon. You know what I mean? And, and I'll get my fill from that. But I don't want to freaking live it. I'm afraid of what my children would think of me if if I fail in those areas. Why? Because that's forever. When I'm closing my eyes for the last time, I I don't want to have that fear. I don't want to have that fear. You know, whether I'm going down there or whether I'm going up there, you know, I, I, I laugh because uh, I... I, I was I was around guys years ago that used to when we talk about that you know in jest, you know, and um, I would get a kick out of this this one guy who been around the block a few times. Um, when he say, "Hey Teddy, I ain't worried about that. I got friends in both places." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. And I, th <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was a I thought it was good. Uh, listen, Mike Tyson. You want me to say he was a great fighter? Then you want me to betray what I really, you know what I mean? You want me to do that? I ain't doing it for, listen, I could do it to be a bigger Teddy Atlas, and I know it would work for me. I, I know it would be, it do great promotional work for me. I know it would it would make me more popular in certain areas. I know it. I'm not that dumb. Not that dumb. But I also know what else it would do to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't want it to do that to me. I think he was a great talent. I think maybe the night with Michael Spinks, maybe the night with my, maybe he could have been that fighter. Maybe, he could, but he didn't never really get tested. But he might have been ready no matter what. I have to be tested that night. That's how good he was. That's how, for, even though it was a guy who used to be a light heavyweight, I get it. <laughs> but it was still a guy who beat Larry Holmes, who still had something left, uh, Michael Spinks. So, and a great puncher, um, and an Olympic gold medalist, but, and a special fighter, one of the great light heavyweights of all time. You know what Mike Tyson was? He was a meteor. He was a meteor that struck across, and not too many meteors. And we still talk about him. Mm -hmm. And 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 unlike Haley's comment, he came back, and and he's walking around, mm -hmm. and he's he has become greater after his career. 
more loved, more beloved, more awed, and he's been forgiven. He found the fountain of forgiveness. I don't know. I wish I could find that, where he has been forgotten for all his shortcomings, all the things that he may have done, may not have done. We don't know. Only him and God know. But he's been forgiven of all that, and he's been not only forgiven, he's raised above it and, and above that and been brought above that. He's been brought to the pyramids of 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 the greatest athletes that, 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 that in the world and in every in every way in every way as a person as a fighter as a historian yeah. as a figure mm-hmm. as a celebrity mm-hmm. i mean even, it's, a, even a philosopher everything yeah so i will take it back all right all you guys out there you forgive me He's the greatest of all time if you encapsulate all that. <laughs> if you encapsulate everything I just tried to describe um, and explain, if you put that all, he's the greatest of all time. Yeah, he is. But he still might be 0-5 in a f- record of 55 fights. He might, in, in Teddy Atlas's book, again, I got friends in both places, mm-hmm. so it's okay. Wherever I go. I have company. Somebody there will like me, despite me saying this. He might be owned five because of five fights where there was something to overcome, which really defines a fight. He came, he he didn't find a way. I know, I'm going to cut you right off because you asked a million dollar question. I wish you didn't, <laughs> but you did. You did. Because that's why. When do I get paid? That's why you get paid. (laughs) I get it. You took the words out of my mouth. (laughs) That's why you are where you are. (laughs) And that's why I'm here. (laughs) The humility. I'm going to, I'm going to, again, full disclosure, it's important, right? Um, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to take some of Cus's wisdom. (laughs) All right. A little bit of mine. Yeah. Um, Cus told somebody that. If Teddy Atlas got his way, he might have been a better person, but we would have risked him not being a great fighter. Now, I believe, and I thought Cus did, and I think he did up to that point in his life, <laughs> that part of your strength of character made you a great fighter um, and truly a great fighter. And part of that battle to be a better person, that that fight, if you will, <laughs> to be a better person, to overcome the things, to be a better person. Um, Part of that fire you have to go through to be a better person. I really, truly bought into it, and and I'm in for life. That is really the only way to be a great fighter. And I don't think that's what Cus meant. I thought he meant, I think he meant that Cus knew more than I did of what was about to come and what would come and what the world was, how people would try to steal him, how people would take him, how people would steal his guy. The last thing he had, to, really, the, the thing that he lived for, because he lived to have another heavyweight champ, the greatest fighter ever, Cus, in Cus's mind, he could be. And I believe that Cus knew that he he could put forward a guy that had the ability to be the greatest fighter ever without fully completing the mission of what it takes to really be great, but that he wouldn't he wouldn't be around to have to witness it. And that he wouldn't he was willing to, he would oh man, this is awful. He's willing to concede that he might be dead in order to have eternal life, in order to have greatness, uh, uh, and which Cus does have greatness, and part of that greatness is attached to Tyson. And he deserves it. He deserves it. Cus was a great man. And I wouldn't be here partly without him. But that was part of the calculation. I know that's deep, and I know that's... Oh, God, I hate myself right now. But, um... But Cus... 
He knew he was getting out free. He knew he was going to not have to be there. He was he was getting off easy. Oh, Teddy, how do you say someone's going to be dead? They're getting off easy. Well, I, I say it again in case you didn't hear me, all right? He, he, he was going to get off easy and not have to face where he came up short because he did his job because he put forward the greatest fight of all time and you guys screwed it up. And he knew that that might happen, but you guys screwed it up. And and whatever, that's your fault. That's on, I'll tell you, Tyson would be mad at this, but that's on Tyson. How can you say that, Teddy? He loved me. I'm not saying he didn't love you, but he loved him. He loved some other stuff too. And I don't know if Tyson could ever come to grips light with that. And, and it's not his job to. But it's my job not to hide from it. I know cousin dimensions that other people just only think they know. Well, he sent oh a message to me. Cuz sent a guy to me. <laughs> my wife was pregnant. We were living in an apartment, apartment in Catsco on Cordes Gil Road. <laughs> we went through all this, I, you know, and I was getting ready to move to Staten Island. And we still were there for a little while before we did, you know, after all this went down. He sent a guy to me, to the house, secret, whatever you want to call it, my wife, me. So I listened to him. Cuz said, if you leave, I'm, I'm a messenger, you know, whatever. If you leave, <laughs> this was in the aftermath of what the gun, the whole thing. You got to remember, Tyson was a ward of the state. He was put in Cus's custody. Cus was looking to adopt him <laughs> for obvious reasons. So he had control and, and he loved him. How dare I say anything less? I won't. But it made sense too. But he was a ward of the state still. Do you know what that means? <laughs> There's rules. Mm -hmm. Means the state's still overlooking it. Mm -hmm. If he ain't living the right life, you know, you gotta remember, he came out. Of, you know, he came out of a jail, so reform school. But if he ain't living the life, he could be taken away from Cus. What's not living the right life? Well, he he wasn't in school no more. They didn't know about it. Um, he he had some things that were going on. We won't get into that right now in school and different things, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he had his trainer put a gun to his head. That ain't so good. If a report came back to them that that happened. He would have been taken away from Cus. That couldn't happen. Look, nobody knows this. Mm -hmm. I talk about it a little bit, but never probably, because why would I? I don't know. Why am I doing it now? I don't know. Because, I don't know. Because I am. Me because doers. it's now. Because it's now, maybe. Maybe because it's now. I don't know. So he sent this man that, you know, obviously we both knew, and he said, here's the deal, Teddy. If no talk about this, wants it to, you know, disappear basically, you leave and he will give you 5% his word. Can you imagine? He will, he will give you 5% of Tyson's earnings for the rest of his career. And, um, but I don't regret it one bit because it wouldn't have happened anyway. See, that's where I, I could be honest with my people say, oh, stand up guy, because I told him to shove it where the, you know, you know, to the, in that place and and um and tell cuz to shove it in that freaking place you know i was mad um teddy teddy don't get angry don't get angry are you out of are you serious get out of here tell him to go shove it over and you know my wife was like huh but and then people like it why didn't you take the deal it wasn't a deal <laughs> it was an escape clause for cuss. It was it, it, it was a it was an insurance policy that his you know that this kid wouldn't be taken away from him. And thank God he wasn't. I wasn't gonna go and say nothing. They didn't have to worry about cuz forgot who I was. Yeah. Cuz forgot why he went to court for me. Because of those because of those characteristics that he said he loved and he noticed and that, that he admired. I didn't lose those characters. He forgot that that was me. He forgot who he was talking to. Yeah. He didn't have to do that. How about that's why I told him to shove it up his ass? Not because of the other insult. Yeah. 
And then, and then when people said to me, oh, you would stand up, because it was around a little bit. It was around in the circles. And then when people, oh, oh stand up, Teddy. He, he didn't care about the money. I said, stand up, Teddy. What are you talking about? How, how, about, how about just realistic, Teddy? How about I live in a real world that I was never going to get that money? So I'm saying, I'm standing up to something that I knew never existed. So I ain't stand up. Not in that way. I am in other ways, maybe, but not don't don't put a medal on my chest for that, because because that never existed. Yeah, it was never meant to exist. But he didn't even understand. That was the one thing that that really disappointed me in Cuss. I was like, Cuss, you really allowed this to get to you, <laughs> where where you where you allowed it to really fog up your thinking to the point where. You're smarter than that. You're better than that. That you would actually think you got a freaking offer me a freaking pieces of silver? Yeah. You really think that? That's what you, freak you. Like all that you told me that you love me and that we, you, I was the young master and the, all this. And, and you think you were going to buy me? And I was going to, and that was going to keep me quiet? How about I would keep quiet because I would always keep quiet. So he thought maybe you might betray him. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And why did he think that? No, no, really. Fear? Yeah, but yeah. Fear is the, at the essence of everything. It's connected with everything. Fear of losing what he was going to lose. But it was more than fear. It was him not believing in the things that he told me he believed in. He didn't even know that. He believed in me because I was a stand-up guy, because I because I didn't sell myself, because because I, you know, I didn't freaking turn evidence. I, I didn't make a deal. I didn't do and I, and that's why he went to court. That's why he stood up for me. And I appreciate it. And that was what he lived by. And that was his, you know, those were the blocks of being a man. Oh, so much for those blocks. But the only way you ever find out if somebody is it's hard. really that it's hard. is to test. Yeah. And it was cussed. This is Shakespearean, you know, this story. <laughs> Cuss told me. Cuss said, and it does come in different forms. Yeah. I and said, all right, Cuss. This was his test. And, and, and some people pass this test because they're able to pass that test because it's not really a test. Not for them because it doesn't speak to their weakness. But it's the test that speaks to the weakness. That's the one. So this one, I, I get it. I get what it spoke to, cuz. And you know what? At the end of the day, I forgive you. And I feel bad for you. I feel bad that you were put in that position after you lived your life that way. And that you, that you taught that and you preached that from the mountaintops. That, that you had to be... That you had to be, I'm not going to use the word, but that that you had to fail yourself and that you had to somehow know that before you died. I just pray that you didn't know that and you still don't know that because you were great. You were great. And, um, and you've given me some. You know, you're giving me something to, to aspire towards. To try to, try to be less weak. Try to be better. And try to be as good as you wanted to be. I wish I can someday. More importantly, I, I wish I could make my father, you know, feel um just feel good up there just um <laughs> do everything you can to the best of your ability every day 
to like yourself. <laughs> to give yourself a reason to actually say, I'd like to be friends with that guy. Loyalty is your chance to have a fulfilled life. Loyalty is your chance to, to have strength, to have all the things you need to have a good life, to be a good parent, be a good husband, be a good grandfather, hopefully be a good role model. Loyalty is... Loyalty is... If you can find something to drink... <laughs> to take into your body to make you prepared for life to, to be all the things that you want to be to be strong enough to be those things loyalty would be the thing you would drink and and when I say loyal I mean unequivocally I mean you know unconditionally <laughs> not conveniently obviously you know that if you could be loyal you could be a good person. You could be a person that you would actually like to be around because you could be a person you could rely on. And I think that's one of the greatest assets that a human being can have. And what do you do when you're betrayed? How do you overcome that? You think of what you learned from it. Use it as a roadmap. to remember and to think back of how you got there and how you got to the place where you got betrayed and how that person got to that place. Try to remember that in your own journey. Just by remembering that I'm still trying to forgive myself for the things that I came up short with. And if I haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> it's probably okay to um to say they didn't figure it out yet they didn't get it at, they didn't figure it out and if I couldn't figure it out and I'm still trying to figure it out maybe I could get over that initial stabbing of uh, what it feels like it does feel kind of like a stabbing that you that you feel when you're betrayed initially and that you can only think of, of anger, <laughs> revenge, hatred. Um, and those things I'm not I'm not proud of that, but um but I felt all those things, you know. And I still feel them sometimes. And then I go back and say, Hey, you're still working at forgiving yourself for some things. Try to remember that kid, you know. Remember is an important thing. Forgetfulness is pretty important too. And um try to remember why we forget. <laughs> why do we forget? Because it wasn't something you felt proud of. Do you think about your death? Are you afraid of it? You know, it's funny you ask that. I never used to think about it. I know people in both places, you know. I know. You don't got it covered. I, <laughs> You're going to be all right. Don't, don't forget that. Yeah. I know people in both places. Yeah. Um, <laughs> both neighborhoods. I, yeah. I, I, um, I've been, I've been, given credit for being brave in certain spots in life. I hope I can be brave when it comes time to leave life. I hope I can be. You know, and and that's, you know, that's just as real and honest as you can be about it. I hope I can be. You know, so far so good. You know, when, when I've had to be certain things that I was scared to freaking death um 
I've, I found a way to beat them for the most part. And um, so I figured when that day comes, I'll figure that out too. This is the Lex Free Podcast.